Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. We may have a small technical issue with the transcription service. No, it's been fixed. Wonderful. Um, we're just waiting for the witness in that case. Yeah, well, that's fine. So this morning we're going to hear from Mrs. Sanger. Yeah. Okay, can you repeat after me? Okay. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thanks. Thank you very much. Can you give your full name, please? Yeah, it's Rajbinder Sanger. Thank you very much, Ms. Sanger. Um, you should have in front of you a bundle that contains a witness statement yep. behind the first tab. <clears throat> um, that witness statement has the unique reference of WITN 103001.00. Um, is it dated the 20th of December 2023? Yes, it is. Thank you. Could I ask you to turn to the final page, um, page 11? Um, and can you see a signature there? Yes. Uh, is that your signature? It is. Can you confirm that that statement is true to the best of your knowledge and yes, belief? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Um, that statement will be published on the inquiry's website, um, and anything I'm asking you today will be supplementary to that. Um, I think we see you in some documents as Rajbinder Baines, is that right? That's correct, yes. Was that your maiden name? It was, yes. Thank you. Um, you currently work at Fujitsu? Yes. Um, before joining Fujitsu, you graduated from university with a BSc in Information Systems in 2005, is that yeah. right? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Um, you held a number of customer services and administrative roles at various companies before joining Fujitsu. Yeah. And that included customer service liaison officer at Dell yeah. and a senior administrator at a Hewlett Packard company. Correct. Thank you. Um, you joined Fujitsu in 2010, July 2010? Yes, that's correct. And you were a, a part of the Fraud and Litigation Support Office? Yes. Um, you held the role of Fraud and Litigation Support Officer? Yes. Um, you took some leave in 2016 and rejoined in 2017 as uh, part of the Release Management Department, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. And, and you stayed in that role until the present day? Yes. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on the period 2010 to 2016, okay. so the period where you were part of the Fraud and Litigation Support Office. Um, you, as part of that job, processed audit data um, and extracted audit data Correct. Um, for what we know as ARQ requests, yeah. or sometimes referred to as ARC requests. Yeah. Uh, can you assist us with very briefly explaining what an ARQ or an ARC request is? An ARC request was um, a record of the transactions that had taken place over the counter at different branches. Uh, and is it held at Fujitsu as part of Fujitsu's records? Yes. And what was your job in relation to that? My job was to process the, re the requests that we received from post office. So just extract the data and then um, send it back to post office. Can we please look at FUJ 00232107? Uh, this is an email from 2013. Um, if we turn to the... Um, third page, we can see the background to this. It seems as though there's been a question about the amount of data that is archived. I think this particular email relates to um, an investigation that's at that time going on by Detica. Um, if we turn to the first page, you set out there the contractual limits to ARQ requests. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Um, so can you please explain to us what the difference between those three figures are? in that email? So this would have been information that I would have got from uh, senior members of the team because I was actually, I was not involved in how many ARQs was set per se. So um, obviously I've gone, back, I've gone back on this email to say that 
in terms of ARQs, we would have 720. Um, for litigation, it would be 250. So am I right to distinguish those two? ARQs would be the, the first line for some other purpose than litigation. Yes. Um, perhaps some sort of disciplinary investigation or something along those lines, or what might that typically I, be? I can't remember. Okay. I can't remember. Um, over time, I think you became involved in other tasks. That can come down. Thank you. Correct. Um, you described in your witness statement maintaining a database um, of user permissions and processing security check <coughs> applications as well. Correct. Um, you've also described working on reconciliation. Yes. Can you assist us with what you meant? So by that? reconciliation was um, a report that we would run every morning for transactions that not, had not completed over the counter. So our role was to um, investigate why these um, raise calls and investigate why these um, transactions hadn't completed. There were other tasks that members of your team were involved in. You've described those as providing Fujitsu help desk logs and also providing witness statements in court cases. Is that right? Correct. Um, can you assist us? Who were the members of your team? The two people that I worked with were uh, Penelope Thomas and Andy Dunks. And can you assist us with what their roles or titles were? I think their titles were the same. The roles were, um, so Andy provided ARQ requests, he processed ARQ requests, he provided help desk calls and also um, witness statements. And uh, Penelope was the same minus the help desk calls. So she processed ARQ requests and provided witness statements. Thank you. I'm just going to stop you there briefly. Um, so I don't know if you're hearing any feedback at all. We, we have a little internal noise in this room. I'm just wondering if it's affecting... It's not, it, it's not coming through to me. Um, and even allowing for um, my growing age... Uh, <laughs> Mr. Blake, uh, it's, it, if there is a noise, I can't hear it. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm told it's a monitor next to the transcriber. Um, Ms. Baines, does it affect you at all? No, no. no it's thank you. Um, you described there are two people in your team. Correct. Are you in the same room? Is it a small room, large room? It's, uh, it's a small, secure room, so we would only have access to that room. So there are three of you all had secure access to a single room yes. working together in that room. Um, where was that office? It was based in Bracknell. In Bracknell. Um, I think we will see some emails about people on different floors. Um, where were you in relation to, say, the engineers or those who were working on? So I, um, I would be based on the fourth floor, and then we had another team called the SSC, and they were based on the sixth floor. Thank you. Um, we see in some documents somebody called Gareth Jenkins, who we've heard a great deal about, yes. um, being described as expert litigation support. Um, is that a description that you're familiar with at all? Sorry, uh, because no. it's being transcribed. No. No. Um, did somebody like Gareth Jenkins have a different role in relation to um, the, the, the team to, to yourself? Not that I'm aware of, no, I, I don't remember. Um, can we please look at FUJ00226099, please? Thank you. This is an email from Penny Thomas to yourself, and you can see there it's headed expert litigation support. Yep. Uh, and she seems to be having a conversation off. Um, sets out a conversation between herself and somebody called Matthew Church. Do you know who Matthew Church was? I don't remember, sorry. No. Um, she says there, hi Matthew, I'm in the process of putting together the charges for Gareth Jenkins for the expert litigation support he provides. Mm. Could you please advise uh, what you charge as an hourly rate? Uh, this is to cover February activities. And his response is his daily rate is £1,199 divided by 7.4 hours to get the hourly rate of 162 pounds to pence. Uh, so that term, expert litigation support, was not something that you were familiar with? No. No. Um, can we look at one more document? It's FUJ00226107. Uh, 
this is again an email from yourself. The subject here is expert litigation support. Um, there are various figures given. So we, we've heard about a case, the case of Mr. Ishak. It sets out there the expenses for Gareth Jenkins for the Ishak case. Uh, and then it says, Gareth booked 31 hours for expert litigation support. His time was expended on the following. Uh, predominantly, this is for the Ishak case, but also related to the second site investigation and other cases, for example, Sefton and Neils, Dixon and Brown. And it sets out there a cost for March of £5,291. Um, what was your role in relation to the fees of Mr Jenkins? Um, I had no role in the fees. Basically, this information would have been sent to me, and then um, my role was just to um, send it on to post office. Uh, and who would it have been sent to you by? Um, it would have been... So this inf the information on here would have been sent from Gareth himself to myself. Uh, are you able to assist us with typical fees per month that might have been incurred by Mr Jenkins? I, I can't remember. I'm going to move on to the topic of your knowledge of issues with the Horizon system. Um, I'm going to begin with when you joined. Can we start by looking at FUJ 00122588, please? Thank you very much. This is a document that predates your joining the team, so it's a 2008 document. Um, it's unlikely that you saw it, but if you did see it, please do no, let us know. <laughs> Um, but I'm just going to take you through to see what kind of information was passed on to you when you joined the team. If we look at the first page, it's called HNGX CP, uh, strengthen the HNGX audit solution and enable analysis of counter event messages. Are you able to assist us with what HNGX CP means? I, I'm able to say that HNGX is what we know as Horizon Online. Does that assist you at all? It seems to be a proposal. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Um, I, I can't remember, sorry. Okay. If we start with a description of the audit system and ARQ service. It says, we are contractually obliged to support the prosecution support service via CS and provide historical extracts of data from the audit archive. Uh, seven years of data used in legal proceedings, often to prove accusations of fraud against postmasters. Um, pausing there, was that your understanding of the contractual position? Yes, yes. Uh, the completeness of the data extracts provided is assumed, and witness statements state as much, and it says, see last page. We'll get onto that last page where we see a form of words that's used in witness statements. The service has worked by providing extracts of repost message stored data only. And then it says, this service, worth the best part of the annual £850,000 security revenue, and that says PS, it looks as though that's inserted by Pete Sewell, um, will remain to 2015 and beyond. Were you aware of the financial significance of the ARQ um, service no. to Fujitsu. No, I wasn't. Were you made aware when you joined the business of its significance? Yes, I was. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's then identified in this document a problem, and, and it quotes from a the number of a peak. Um, are you aware what a peak is? We've yes. looked at those. Yes. I Thank am. you. So it has PC zero one five two three seven six highlighted that in certain error conditions in the EOD process, repost cannot be relied upon to write a consistent set of messages to the local store. Um, just pausing there, I wonder whether we can get up PC012376. It's at FUJ00154684. We'll just have a quick look at the underlying peak that's referred to here. It can either be alongside or separate. That's, that's fine. Thank you. Um, this is the first page. Could we look at about halfway down the page if we could have a look at the words um, 
we scroll down slightly, it refers to a member of the NBSC. Uh, scroll down a little, thank you. Um, Ibrahim from the NBSC, that's the National Business Support Centre, has asked that an issue be investigated by our software team regarding discrepancies still showing when the MIS stock unit is rolled to clear the local suspense account. I'm not going to ask you in any detail about this particular problem, but it relates to discrepancies showing. And if we turn over to page three, please. There's an entry on page three from Mr. Barnes, who we're going to hear from tomorrow. Um, 2nd of January 2008, so this is two years before you joined the team. Um, and he says as follows, the fact that EPOS code is not resilient to errors is endemic. There seems little point fixing it in this one particular case, because there'll be many others to catch you out. For example, when I tried to balance with cabs process running, I found that declaring cash failed with the same sort of error message. It may be worth passing on the general message to the HNGX team that in many cases code should always try and exit gracefully after an error and not just blunder on regardless. Um, just pausing there, were you made aware when you joined the team of issues with, for example, the EPOS code? No, I wasn't. No. Um, could we go back to the document that we were just looking at? So that's FUJ00122588, please. Were you aware with general issues regarding data integrity and concerns about the integrity of, for example, ARQ data? Uh, no, I wouldn't have been because um, it wasn't part of my role. And <clears throat> if there was issues within the system, it would be dealt with higher members of the team, so members that had more knowledge of the system. Um, so... S sticking where we are, let's move to the second bullet point under problem. It says this particular issue has been fixed, uh, but it's very probable that similar problems exist in the Horizon system. Uh, therefore, the process of providing data now needs to include the extraction and cross-checking of event data to help identify where data integrity might be compromised. Uh, the statements currently asserted in witness statements cannot be guaranteed in all cases even after this CP, uh, but this CP seeks to strengthen the process and allow us to reliably identify where the assertion can or cannot be made. Um, and then it says, current process, many manual steps requiring great care and skill from individual resources, obvious potential for human error, uh, data distributed or transferred over too many platforms slash media, inherently insecure, and it's a tactical solution um, which has introduced further manual steps. Were you aware, as somebody who was involved in that overall ARQ process, that there had been uh, a number of manual steps to work around certain problems? No, I wasn't. And if we go over the page, please. Um, under benefit and risk, if we scroll down slightly, it says as follows, if we cannot better identify where data integrity can or cannot be guaranteed, then we're in breach of contract and may be fined heavily or not be able to offer the ARQ service or will undermine confidence in the service. And then scrolling down, we have that witness statement extract. We'll see in due course this becomes part of or is included in a pro forma type witness statement. Yeah. Um, it's a form of words that says as follows, an audit of all information handled by the TMS, um, that's Transaction Management Service, is taken daily by copying all new messages to archive media, etc. cetera, and, and it details the process that's involved. Um, just pausing there on this particular document, do you think at the time that you joined the ARQ team, it would have been helpful to have known about concerns about the integrity of the ARQ system? Yes. yes. You joined then in July 2010. Could we please move to FUJ00122925, please?
Um, this is 14th of July 2010, and you are sent by Penny Thomas a standard witness statement for you to read through. Now, was this very early on in your time? Was this reading into the job? or Yes, it was. It was reading into the job and understanding what roles we were undertaking. Um, and we can have a look at that standard witness statement. That's at FUJ 00122926. Thank you very much. Um, this is the attachment to that email, and it doesn't currently have anybody's name on it. Uh, it's a pro forma standard witness statement um, that says as follows. It says, I'm authorized by Fujitsu Services to undertake extractions of audit archive data and to obtain information regarding system transactions recorded on the Horizon system. Uh, scrolling down, it says, Horizon's documented procedures stipulate how the Horizon system operates, and while I'm not involved with any of the technical aspects of the Horizon system, these documented processes allow me to provide a general overview. Uh, was it your understanding that this was to be used by those who weren't, for example, the engineers like Gareth Jenkins, um, so didn't have quite that technical understanding, but who nevertheless provided correct. some evidence in criminal proceedings? Yes, correct. Um, could we scroll over the page, over to page three? Um, on that second paragraph on page three, that's the form of words that I just took you to in that earlier 2008 document. And then if we go over the page again, There is, um, if we scroll down a little bit, um, it sets out the various controls that apply to the audit extraction process. Um, for example, it says that one, extractions can only be made through the audit workstations which exist at Fujitsu Services, and it gives the address. Um, can I just, stopping there, did you, were you part of that extraction process? Did you I extract? Would. Yes. yes. Uh, number two, uh, logical access to the audit workstation and its functionality is managed in accordance with um, certain principles. They include dedicated logins, password control, and use of Microsoft Windows NT security features. Uh, so in order to extract the data, there were certain security controls in place to ensure um, that there were sufficient controls on that data. Correct, yes. Um, three, all extractions are logged. Um, on the audit workstation and supported by documented audit record queries authorized by nominated persons within the post office. Uh, this log can be scrutinized on the audit workstation. Four, extractions are only made by authorized individuals, etc. Uh, so this is essentially reassuring a court as to the integrity of the data because it can't be accessed by those who don't have a login, for example. Yes. If we go over the page, please, to page five. Um, if we scroll down three quarters of the way, we can see where a particular ARQ number is inserted. Um, so this is the pro forma part that would be filled out by that, the person completing that statement. ARQ number, uh, so I think that means to insert the number there. Yes was received on insert the date uh, and asked for information in connection with post office at, and then you give the post office uh, branch details. Uh, and that's effectively producing the ARQ data for the court. Is that your understanding? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Um, and could we scroll to, down to the final substantive page? It's page seven. Thank you very much. And it's that paragraph that's currently on the screen, it, um, the bottom paragraph there. This is another part of that standard witness statement. It's a form of words that we'll see in a number of other witness statements. It says as follows, uh, there is no reason to believe 
that the information in this statement is inaccurate because of the improper use of the system. To the best of my knowledge and belief, at all material times, the system was operating properly, or if not, any respect uh, in which it was not operating properly or was out of operation was not such as to affect the information held within it. Um, does that paragraph, did that paragraph at the time cause you any concern? No. no. Does it now cause you any concern? Um, no, it doesn't. No. It doesn't cause you any concern. We're now going to look at an issue in 2010, so the year you joined with ARQ data. Can we please look at FUJ 0017283? <coughs> The document we're going to look at is another peak, and we're going to look at an entry that begins on the 21st of June 2010, so very soon um, before you joined. It's FUJ 0017283. And it covers the period when you did join subsequently. Okay. But we'll start with the entry on the 21st of June, 2010. Thank you. Um, so we can see there it's PC 02000468. Um, there's a summary at the top, perhaps I, I will read that out, but we will get to that. That's further down in the log. It says, from Penny, in a nutshell, the HNGX, that's Horizon Online, application is not removing duplicate transactions, which may have been recorded twice in the audit server, and they are appearing in the ALQ returns. Uh, for the old Horizon application, Riposte automatically removed duplicate entries, an initial analysis shows that one third of all ARQ returns since the new application has been in play have duplicated transactions. If we scroll down please to the second entry in this log, we have an entry from Penny Thomas. Um, she says, while performing an audit retrieval for branch and it gives the branch details, duplicate transactions have been found uh, and it gives the date. Initial analysis shows that duplicate records are held in two different audited TMS files. Scrolling down the page, the final entry on the page from Mr. Barnes. Um, he says as follows on the 22nd of June, uh, the way it works is that it processes all the results in a given file, building up an internal table of transaction sequence for that file. Uh, then, at the very end of the processing, the file, it dumps the internal table to um, and gives details of the table. It does not cross-check the transactions in one file against another file. Um, and he, he outlines two solutions that are possible. There's an easy solution. Um, as each transaction is processed, a check, uh, a check is made, uh, and if it's already there, the transaction is ignored, writing a warning to the query log. The problem with this solution is that a query needs to be made to the database for every transaction. And then he describes a more difficult solution. If we go over the page, please. Uh, the internal table, uh, which at the moment is built up on a per file basis, is changed to being built up on a per query basis. Uh, the check for duplicate transactions is then done within the internal table. Uh, this is a much more thorough approach, but will take much more work. Uh, and then there's an entry on the 22nd of June 2010, um, and it's uh, outlining the details of a fix to this problem. If we scroll down, it describes the impact on the user of the issue. It's about halfway down this page. Thank you. Impact on user. Um, it's almost at the bottom of this page. It says, occasionally, duplicate transactions are listed 
in the spreadsheets produced and presented to court for prosecution cases. Uh, these can give the defense teams ground to question the evidence. Um, and then it says, have relevant KELs been created or updated? So a KEL, do, are you aware of a known error log? Yes, I am. Yes. Um, it says, no known error logs have been created for this since we intend to fully resolve the issue shortly. Uh, and if we scroll down, there are risks that are outlined of the fix. And it says, if we do not fix this problem, our spreadsheets presented in court are liable to be brought into doubt if duplicate transactions are spotted. And if we go over the page, please. It says, query DLL.DLL is a recent component introduced for Horizon Online and has not yet fully bedded down, and so it's likely to change as problems such as this one are spotted. Just pausing there, on joining the team, and you, you've said it, it was a small team, three people, um, were you not made aware of issues such as this that could affect the reliability of information presented to court? No, I wasn't made aware. If we scroll down, um, let's look at the entry of the 23rd of June from Penny Thomas. It's just there. It says, initial analysis of all ARQ returns since the Horizon Online application has been implemented identifies approximately one third of all returns have duplicate entries. This is now extremely urgent. Scroll down, please, towards the bottom of the page, an entry of the 7th of July, 2010. Uh, it, it's the bottom entry that's currently on screen, 7th of July 2010, and it says as follows, um, it says that it's been fixed essentially 7th of July. And then if we keep on going down, scrolling down over the page of the 30th of July, It seems that there's, a, in fact, a testing of the fix, 30th of July. Uh, it says there, the entry from Sheila Bamba says, this peak has been tested in LST and fix will be released with release to data center. And down to the bottom of the page, an entry from Penny Thomas. <coughs> 1st of September 2010, fix successfully deployed. So it, it seems as though that peak, that incident log was open um, from before you joined and wasn't closed until the 1st of September uh, and wasn't successfully fixed until the 1st of September, um, so after you had joined the yes. team. Does it cause you any concern that you weren't aware of that kind of thing on joining an interview? Yeah, it does, because obviously um, I didn't realise that the data, that there was um, these issues yes. with the... Can we please ha have a look at FUJ 0017247? Um, this is an email chain from Penny Thomas. You are copied in at this stage, and this is 21st of July. 2010, and its title is PC020468. Um, so it does certainly seem as though you were copied into conversations about this particular issue. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do. Could, could we please look at page 10? It's a discussion of the issue that we've just looked at. Um, so, from Penny Thomas to Pat Lywood, are you able to assist us? Who, I think it says at the top there, service implementation manager. Was Pat Lywood somebody who you knew? No. No. Um, if we look at that final entry, Penny Thomas says as follows, the bottom entry. Um, we have a very significant problem which has been recorded and it gives the peak details. In a nutshell, 
The Horizon Online application is not removing duplicate transactions, which may have been recorded twice on the audit server, and they are appearing in the ARQ returns. For the old Horizon application, Repost automatically removed duplicate entries. An initial analysis shows that one third of all ARQ returns since the new application has been in play have duplicated transactions. That's the entry effectively taken from the peak yeah. or later inserted into the peak. Um, can we look at page nine, please? You're not at this stage copied in. This is a chain that was ultimately copied to you, but you're not part of this discussion. If we look at the bottom of page nine, there's an email from Graham Walsh to a number of people at Fujitsu. Looking at their names, they all seem to be involved in, in the technical aspects of Horizon. Um, so it's the bottom of page eight. Thank you. If we stop there, uh, and then the email itself is on the top of page nine, as we can see. He says as follows, please see below and attached for your information. In essence, we have a problem with the ARQ extraction tool. Under Horizon, this would inhibit the duplication transactions held for the audit server and thus supply evidence for court, etc., without duplicate records. However, the Horizon Online tool uh, does not, and thus duplicate records that cannot be differentiated are supplied as evidence, uh, thus could allow for legal challenge to the integrity of the system. Now, you don't have recollection of discussing this issue. You're at least on the chain of this issue. Right. Uh, why do you think it is that the significance of this was not um, more prominent in your three-person team? Um, I think this has dealt with senior members of the team that obviously had more knowledge of the system. Um, but you, you are one of those people who is extracting the correct. ARQ data. Um, it, it says that there, that there is a problem with the ARQ extraction tool uh, and could allow for a legal challenge to integrity of the system. Um, I mean, looking back at it, does it seem to you to be quite a significant issue? Yes, looking back at it now, yes, it is. Um, but it wasn't at the time. It wasn't seen within your team as a yeah, significant yes. issue. Yes. Or not sufficiently prominent to draw to your attention. Yeah. <coughs> Could we look at the bottom of page six and into page seven, please? There's an email from Andrew Mansfield, um, and he says as follows, uh, Gerald has produced a fix for release one and it's ready to go. Uh, he has added an impact statement to the peak that includes a brief statement on testing. Uh, an audit request should be performed that retrieves and processes TMS files containing duplicate transactions. It should be confirmed that the duplicate transactions have been removed from the final spreadsheet generated by the audit application. The peak is currently with RMF for targeting, uh, and he says, there has been discussion of a possible workaround. This involves modifying the audit queries so that the message numbers are included in the output to the spreadsheets. Currently, they are not. Uh, this would allow the duplicate messages to be identified and removed by running a macro on the final spreadsheet generated um, by the application. Uh, he then says, if we could scroll down slightly, uh, Penny Thomas is in discussion with the post office over whether this workaround is acceptable in the short term. Uh, could we scroll to um, up, please, to page five? The bottom of page five. Thank you. If we could stop there. Um, so we have a message from Penny Thomas saying that the post office has gone to the post office legal for guidance and further returns have been identified this morning as bound for court. 
So that it seems as though ARQ data is heading to court whilst this issue has already been identified. Um, and then we have a response from Graham Welsh, and he says, please see below from Penny. I understand that there are more court cases pending, and whilst the briefing to the investigation has taken place, they're coming back requesting help due to the level of activity and nervousness regarding the current workaround. Um, in terms of workarounds, as somebody who is extracting the data, were you performing this workaround? Were you, for example, manually checking certain things due to this kind of issue? I, I can't remember. I mean, presumably you did more than just press a button and the ARQ data comes up on your screen. No, so my role was to extract the um, data. So basically um, enter in the branch code, enter a date range, and that would extract the information. And that, that, that was my responsibility. So you weren't involved in the actual checking of the underlying no, data? No, I was not there. I wasn't, um, my role was not to analyze the data. And who was it that would perform things like these workarounds that we see here? So something like checking dupe for duplicate within so so part of the process would have been that when we extracted the data another member of the team would ensure that whatever had been requested um, was included in the like, is what was produced and you say another member of the team I mean there were, there were three of you so yeah it would either been Andy or Penny can we please look at page four if we scroll up Thank you. The bottom of page four um, from somebody called Tom Lillywhite, who is the principal security consultant. He says, I've just read this, suggest keeping Penny in the loop. Uh, she knows how nervous the customer is or will become and may have something to add. Uh, at this stage, do you have any interaction with the post office? Apart from um, uh Processing the request, that's, that's the only interaction I had with them. So you would send something to the post office? Yes, yes. If we have a look at the email above, um, Mr. Welsh says as follows, he says, sorry if we could just scroll out, thank you. Um, the sooner this is resolved, the easier the task will be in managing post office expectations in this area while minimizing the risk of duplicated effort by having to reproduce reports already provided. Um, so it, it seems as though there is a, a, an attempt to avoid having to reproduce those reports that have already been provided in, for example, court proceedings. Correct. Um, given that this was, you were a part of a very small team uh, and you were part of that ARQ process, does it not strike you as odd that there wasn't a conversation with, for example, Penny Thomas about this issue? Penny was a senior member of the team, so she dealt with this, these kind of issues. But I don't recall having a conversation, no, being told. Was she somebody who kept her cards very close to her chest? Was she not somebody who discussed <coughs> issues that were actually affecting the very job that you were carrying out? Um, Sorry, can you repeat that question again? Sorry. Um, I think what we've identified is that there is a serious issue that's identified right. in various emails. Um, if we look at the first email, it seems to have at least been copied to you, but I think your evidence is that you don't remember any discussion about it. Um, and really, my question is, why didn't you have a conversation with Penny Thomas? What, was there something about Penny Thomas that made it unlikely that you would have a conversation about it? I don't recall having the conversation. Yes, and in terms of Penny Thomas, yes. what was your relationship? Um, my relationship with, with Penny was if there was something that I was unsure of in terms of the ARQ request, I would approach her. Yes, um, but there were, that I can come down, thank you. Um, there were three of you in the room, did you sit in silence all day? Did you discuss matters that affected your work? 
we discussed things, yes. Uh, and why do you think it is, it, or may be, that Penny Thomas didn't discuss an issue such as this with you? I don't know. I don't know. Um, now, we saw that you received that draft statement um, early on in your time at the post office, the, the draft pro forma statement that we, um, that we looked at. That was dated or sent to you on the 14th of July. We're now on the 21st of July when this chain is being sent to you, so not that far after having received that statement. Um, did it not cause you any concerns about the reliability of the statement, the pro forma statement? At the time, no, because I was not involved in producing a witness statement or um, going to court proceedings. Yes. Um, does it cause you any concern now? Yes, it does. Uh, and why does it cause you concern now? Because obviously we had bugs in the system. Um, can we please look at FUJ00225940? This is another peak. Um, thank you. This is peak PC 024310, and it relates to duplicate JSN detected. Uh, and the summary there, if we scroll down, uh, support overhead currently 30 incidents in five days. Resolution will mean that any future occurrences will have a different root cause and require investigation. Such incidents are currently getting masked by the volume associated with this peak with consequential risk to the integrity of the audit trail used for litigation support. Um, if we scroll down, please. We have an entry of the 13th of September. So a couple, a couple of months into the, into the job. And it says there, exception raised while processing message event, serious system error. And perhaps we could look at page eight, please. And a couple of entries on page eight. Thank you. The second entry there, the 19th of October 2010, an, um, an entry that says as follows, a new business impact has been added. Uh, this peak will reduce the support overhead because it will reduce the number of alerts associated with duplicate JSNs. Uh, it will also mean that any future occurrences will have occurred for a different reason and would require investigation. Such incidents are currently getting masked by the occurrences associated with this peak. There's no immediate benefit to the customer other than support engineers no longer need to worry about these types of alerts and can focus on other alerts. Currently, this type of error generates a relatively high frequency of alerts on a daily basis, masking other types of error. If we scroll down near the bottom of the page to the 2nd of November, an entry from Steve Parker, he says as follows, well, um, the business impact has been updated. Support overhead, currently 30 incidents in five days. Resolution will mean that any future occurrences will have a different root cause and require investigation. Such incidents are currently getting masked by the volume associated with this peak with consequential risk to the integrity of the audit trail used for litigation support. Do you recall this issue? I do. You do? Yeah. And why do you recall this issue? Or was it about this issue that stood out? I just remember being um, made aware that we had duplicate <coughs> JSNs. Um, in terms of um, the severity of it, technical background, um, I didn't have that much knowledge of the system, but I remember being told about this, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to take you to an email chain. It's at FUJ00228770. An email chain from November 2010. 
And, and can we start on page five, please? Uh, we'll see your name appear within this email chain. Um, on, if we look at page five, you're not currently copied in on this particular email. Um, but this reference. Uh, these are all safe to ignore. Three, we risk other parts of the program by trying to force through a fix. I think we've heard during earlier parts of this inquiry things like um, code regression or uh, other issues with code caused by particular fixes. Yes. Is that something you're aware of? Um, I'm not aware of it. As a general principle? Yeah, as a general principle, yeah. Um, for risk to audit is very small, uh, should a true duplicate JSN slip through, then it will be noticed by a failure as described and it gives a reference. Such incidents will still need to be investigated urgently. A pragmatic approach, given the above, is to ignore all duplicate JSN messages in BAL logs until the issue is resolved, which is going to be early next year. There is a small risk that by ignoring this event, we will be missing an issue that needs investigation. <coughs> if we look at page three, at the bottom of page two into page three, there is discussion about the workaround that is um, going to take place until the actual resolution of the issue. Bottom of page two into page three. It's an email from somebody called Sarah Selwyn to Steve Parker and others. Is Sarah Selwyn someone familiar to you? I know of her. Yeah. Do you know what her role was at all? I can't remember. Um, so, thank you. She says as follows. I, Steve, I agree with your approach. As long as any JSN duplicates that match the criteria described are, are still investigated urgently, as you described below in item four. Um, the second paragraph explains the workaround. She says, what has not been highlighted below is the additional effort that the existence of duplicates places on the litigation support team. Until the two fixes related to the peaks described below are delivered to live, Penny and team will need to run the macro provided as a workaround against every spreadsheet generated by the fast ARQ method to determine if there are any duplicate spreadsheet rows present. Uh, these rows do not include JSN. Just pausing there, we're going to hear more about it this week. But can you assist us with uh, what a fast ARQ was as opposed to a slow one? Um, a fast ARQ, what I can recall is, I think we used to put the date range and the FAD code and click a button and it would return the um, data. And a slow one would be what more manual? Uh, I, yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, thank you. If we go back to the substantive email, please. It continues as follows. Um, it says, if there are any duplicate spreadsheet rows present, these rows do not include JSN. Um, if there are duplicates present, then Penny and team run one of the slow ARQ queries, uh, which have been modified to include JSN in order to determine if the duplicate is a true duplicate. So it seems as though the workaround involves um, looking for duplicate entries and then changing the process if duplicate entries are found. Is that something you recall at all? Uh, I, yeah, I don't recall, sorry. If we look at that, that, fine, that third paragraph on the page, 
uh, halfway through that paragraph. It says, Penny and team will need to continue manually running the work around macro until at least April next year. Uh, the resolution, thank you very much. Um, the resolution, uh, and it gives the reference to the peak, delivered 3.20 early next year should reduce JSN duplicates in any Horizon Online audit analyzed, uh, but the macro will still need to be run until a, a certain release just in case the audit being analyzed is uh, etc. cetera. Um, so it, it seems as though Penny Thomas and the team, would that team involve your, I mean, who would that be, Penny, Tom, Penny and team? Is that your team, is that? Correct, Penny, um, myself and Andy. Um, so the three of you would need to continually manually running the workaround macro until April next year. So a considerable period of time. We're in November until April. Yes. Do you recall the, the, the first document that I took you to, or the second document, the, the 2008 document about um, her, legacy horizon having these manual workarounds which creates risk? Um, if we apply those concerns here, um, can you see potential risks to this workaround process for um, audit data? Yes, I can see potential risks, yes. Uh, and we've seen those witness statements, for example, that talk about the security needed, the logins needed, the special entry to the special room. But if those who are carrying out the process are themselves carrying out a more manual process, uh, do you see risks involved in yes, that? Yes, yes. Um, and then if we go to the first page. So the very first, thank you very much. But you're not copied in here. And um, so you were copied into the earlier chain, but this is, seems to be um, uh, the top of the chain that you're not, don't appear to be copied into. <coughs> And it's from Penny Thomas, and she says, all the analysis we have conducted covering, in fact, sorry, if we could, um, if we could go over the page, sorry, if we could start on the second page, because there's an email from Sarah Selwyn to Penny Thomas, yourself, uh, and others. And she says, Penny and Raj, thank you both for your analysis of the business impact of running the workaround fixes for detection of JSNs in HNGX audit. Do you remember carrying out analysis of the business impact? I don't. No. Um, do you think it's likely that you were part of that, given that she has addressed both of you and said thank you both yes, for your analysis? Yes, definitely. Yeah, I was part of it, yeah. Uh, and she says, Penny, the per... Right. I was just going to say it wasn't on my screen, Mr. Blake, but oh. it popped up as I was um, saying it. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Um, so, so it's an email from Sarah Selwyn who says, Penny and Raj, Thank you both for your analysis of the business impact on running the workaround fixes for detection of JSNs in HNGX audit. Uh, Penny, the permanent fixes to the audit workstation for JSN detection and analysis will be supplied in the release 4.37, uh, which is currently expected to be out of LST on the 4th of May 2011. There is no live data predicted yet for the release. Um, but usually this would follow within a few days. <clears throat> you should expect to be running the workaround solution until May 2011. That's similar detail to the detail we've just seen. Um, and then if we go, please, to the first page, which is where Penny Thomas addresses a wider audience, explains the workaround, and she says, the analysis we have conducted covering receipts over the last four months. Does that assist you with your recollection as to the, the analysis that was conducted? Yes. Yes, and what might that mean, covering receipts over the last four months? Um, I think this is the request that we received. So we would have... Um, Can you explain that? Can you just explain that question? Absolutely. Sorry. I think you conducted some analysis, and she is um, telling people about the analysis that's being conducted. Perhaps you can assist us with that first paragraph. 
I can't remember the analysis that I had done. Yes. Yeah. But are you able to assist by looking at that, what it might have involved? I can't, sorry. Mm. Um, it continues, we anticipate that by May 11, the bulk of the requests we receive will be for Horizon Online records covering the time frame January to December 2010. Indeed, from February 2011, the bulk of the requests may consist of Horizon Online records. Um, then there's a paragraph that describes the work around, if we scroll down, and she says, uh, therefore, for all retrievals, we will need to include additional spreadsheet and a checking process. Um, and then running additional reports, using a macro and manually checking spreadsheets will increase significantly the time to complete a retrieval. I estimate that an additional 20 minutes will be required to complete each ARQ, and that will require an additional three working days per month to be found. Additional work requirements are already being placed on the prosecution support team in the form of supporting reconciliation, and there is a possibility we will be uh, more than stretched to fulfill our required ARQ return timeframes. Uh, these changes will alleviate unnecessary pressure on the team and should be implemented at the earliest opportunity. Um, do you recall during this period your small team being particularly busy um, with these workarounds, with creating, for example, um, manually checking various spreadsheets? Yes. Yes. And did you personally get involved in that process? Yes, I did. Uh, we've talked about earlier issues that I, I think your evidence can, can be accurately summarised as um, not being seen as such significant issues or not significant enough to have been brought to your attention. Correct, yeah. Was this particular issue seen as a significant issue? Yes, it was, yeah. Yes. Uh, and it was seen as a significant issue, why? because of uh, the data we were providing back to post office. Uh, and what were the concerns? That um, there, was there could be duplicate transactions. And obviously, because this information was being provided to post office to be taken to um, court, so it seemed quite... Because it could impact on the reliability Correct. of the audit data that is being provided to the post office. Correct, yes. Um, I want to ask you about the provision of witness statements. Could we please look at FUJ00225719, please? And I'm going to start on the bottom of page two into page three, please. And that's an email of the 6th of September, 2010. Um, so we're going slightly back in time now. Um, there's an email from yourself to Andy Dunks, and you say as follows, just spoken to Maureen, and the data uh, for Kirkuswald, that's a, a post office, needs to be resent as this had duplicated data. Um, I have re-ran the reports for you, so please can you check and get these sent to the post office, as I understand that these will also require the witness statements as well. So please, can you get this done, as we will need to get this out as soon as possible, as this will be going to court on the 20th of September. So it seems as though there is an ARQ return that contains duplicated data um, in September 2010, and you are asking Andy Dunks to check. Is that right? Correct, yes. And if we scroll up, we have an email from Penny Thomas to yourself and says, please make sure Andy also uh, presents 059. Are you able to assist us with, with what that means? No, I, I don't know what 059 was. No. I don't know whether it was an ARQ request or a request for a witness statement. If we see their subject uh, and then it has ARQ PO. 48-PO58, and it then refers to 59. Does that assist you at all? 
I, I don't know what 5.9 would have been, no, sorry. Um, if we scroll up, please, there's an email from yourself to Penny Thomas, and you say as follows, Andy has checked the information on the disk, but with regards to the witness statement mentioned uh, that I would need to compile this as a, I have run the retrievals off. Please advise whether I would need to do this. And then if we go over um, to the first page, please, there's a response from Penny Thomas to Andy Dunks. And she says as follows, Andy, as you know, these returns are reruns of work you have already completed. Three out of the 12 of your returns contain duplicate transactions. Uh, all need to be represented on one disk. They are due in court on the 20th of September. Uh, we have to get them to Salford, and they, in turn, have to relay to the investigator. So we need to get them in the post today. Uh, in order to get them these out as quickly as possible, I asked Raj to rerun them for you. Uh, if you're really unhappy to take ownership of the work she has completed on your behalf, please can you rerun them for yourself. Uh, Raj can show you the fast ARQ process, which really is not onerous at all. Uh, you will need to update your witness statement. The disk and statement needs to be in the post today, please. It seems as though um, Penny Thomas has e effectively stepped in um, to say that Andy Dunk should be providing the witness statement, but, but not yourself. Correct, yes. Is that right? Yeah. And is that something that she did regularly? Um, so when I joined the company, I wasn't comfortable in providing a witness statement. So any requests that did come in for a witness statement, it would be either Penny or Andy that would provide that. Yes. Um, can we please look at FUJ 00156224? This is a different case, Preston Road Post Office. Um, and you're being asked by a detective constable, so this is a police request for a witness statement. And he says, firstly, many thanks for producing the further disk with ARQ data for the Preston Road office. Uh, could I please trouble you to provide a statement exhibiting the CD that you sent through? Um, I can provide a draft statement and send it to you unless you have a corporate document that can be used. Uh, Penny Thomas provided one such statement previously for this case. And if we look at the top email, there's an email from yourself to Andy Dunks. And you say, I've been requested to produce a statement for Preston Road. Please see below. When you're free, are you able to go through the witness statement document with me, as I have not produced one? Um, is that a, a reference to the pro forma statement that we saw earlier today? Yes, it is, yep. Um, and it seems at that point, it may be that you're considering whether you will give a witness statement or not. Yes. Can we please look at FUJ 00122622? Uh, the officer in that email refers to a earlier witness statement from Penny Thomas, and, and we have that earlier witness statement. It's dated the 28th of September 2009. And this is very much like the pro forma that we saw earlier. Do, do you agree with that? Yes. If we look at page three, for example, Um, about halfway down, it has the words Preston Road branch, and it gives the, that's the insertion of the particular branch into the pro forma. Uh, and then that final paragraph, for example, is the one that we saw from the 2008 document into the pro forma. Yep. And here we see it in an actual statement. Over the page, please. We have the various controls that apply, we, we've already looked at those in the pro forma. Uh, and then over another page, please. And we have uh, below that, please, uh, over the page. At the bottom of this page, we have that paragraph that appeared in the pro forma, there is no reason to believe that the information in this statement is inaccurate because of the improper use of the system. To the best of my knowledge and belief, 
at all material times the system was operating properly, or if not, any respect in which it was not operating properly or was out of operation was not such as to affect the information held within it. Um, now, when we began today and you looked at the pro forma, I think your evidence was you didn't see a problem with that paragraph. Having gone through all of the various issues that have been identified, um, would you yourself sign up to that form of words? No, no, I wouldn't. Uh, and why not? Because of all the issues that have been identified. Could we please look at FUJ 00123081? And this is the statement that was ultimately provided. It seems as though Penny Thomas actually provided the Preston Road statement in the end. Uh, we're there, 19th of October, 2010. Um, she's provided a second statement. And she says, further to my statement, dated the 28th of September, 2009. So that's further to the statement we just saw. And if we could scroll down, please. She then exhibits uh, the data that you produced, and we see at the bottom of the next page, uh, again, that form of words used at the very bottom into the next page, same form of words from the previous statement, same form of words from the pro forma. Is that right? If we yes. keep on scrolling, please. Thank you. Um, could we look at page 17 of the same document, please? There's an email chain on page 17, which is the original request from the officer at the bottom of the page that we've already seen. If we have a little look at that. So that's the request from the officer. And then if we scroll up, Penny Thomas says as follows. She says, please be advised that all requests for Fujitsu support, i.e. data, statements, court attendance, etc., uh, are to be requested via the security team at Salford. We're unable to respond to any requests you may make. And if we scroll up to page 15, please, there's the response from the officer. Um, he emails Mark Dinsdale. Is Mark Dinsdale the appropriate person at Fujitsu to contact about the obtaining of a witness statement? Is that something you're able to assist with? Mark Dinsdale. I recall the name, but I can't remember whether he was Fujitsu or post office. Um, he, the officer says as follows, Penny Thomas provided a very thorough statement previously for this case. All I require now is a brief statement to exhibit the second disc uh, which has been produced. Raja Baines dealt with this request from the post office uh, and I have received the disc. Uh, and then he sets out a potential form of words for a statement, essentially just exhibiting the audit records that you had produced. And if we look at the top of that email, sorry, if we, if we scroll down, um, the final paragraph there, he says, I, I would appreciate if this could be passed on to Raj, ideally, or another who could complete this statement tomorrow and get it sent to me as a matter of urgency as the trial commences next week. Um, if we scroll up to the very top. We have Mark Dinsdale to Penny Thomas. He says, Penny, are you asking... Are you able to ask Raj to do the witness statement, please? So it seems as though very much the officer um, and those elsewhere potentially at Fujitsu had in mind for you to be the author of that statement. Uh, but ultimately, it was Penny Thomas that provided the statement. Yes, correct, yeah. Yes. Um, if we go back to page one of this document, this is the statement that we've just been looking at. There's just a, a paragraph on the first page that I would like to take you to. 
So I'm just going to read that second substantive paragraph on this page. It says, the data requested was originally supplied to Post Office Limited on the 26th of August 2010 by Regbinder Baines. I've reviewed the archived ARQ data extracted by Regbinder Baines and confirmed that the data provided was extracted from the Horizon system in accordance with the requirements of ARQs 226 to 228-1011 and that the extraction process followed the outlined procedure. I produce a CD containing the results and exhibits them. The CD contains a certified true copy of the original transaction data supplied in August 2010. This data has been held securely on the audit data work stream, uh, workstation since its original extraction and contains no additions, deletions or other amendments. Um, it, would you agree that it's quite unusual for somebody who didn't actually download the data to be using this form of words within a witness statement, to, to be exhibiting data um, as having been, for example, been extracted in accordance with the requirements um, and following a, a certain procedure when, in fact, she wasn't the one who did the downloading or extraction? Does that strike you as unusual at all? Um, looking at it, yes. Yes. Um, how, for example, could she have said that she it was extracted in accordance with procedure? Do you think she was well placed to make that statement? Well, it would have been a, a process that I would have followed to extract the information. So, um... because if we scroll over and we go to the standard wording that I've that we've been through a couple of times, um, at the bottom of the second page into the third page, that standard wording again that I think your evidence has been, it's not a form of words that you would have signed up to, uh, that there's no reason to believe that the statement, that the information is inaccurate because of the improper use of the system and that to the best of her knowledge and belief at all material times, the system was operating properly. Did you have a conversation with Penny Thomas in advance of her signing this statement uh, about the system, about the process that you undertook to obtain the ARQ data? No, no, I wouldn't have. Because I think it, in your witness statement, paragraph 21, I, don't, I can take you to it, I think you say you didn't have a conversation with no. Penny Thomas about the contents of witness statements. No, because th I never, that was not part of my role to um, deal with witness statements. Um, it, do you see it in any way odd or unusual um, that Penny Thomas would have signed a statement that said that the system was operating properly, exhibiting the ARQ data that you had extracted, um, but not having any conversations with you about that data? No. You don't see that as unusual? No. Uh, why not? Um, it was a process that I followed, um, and... Yeah, I, I, I was not involved in witness statements, so I, I just assume it was part of the process that whatever had been extracted would be included in the, into the witness statement. Um, I'd like to look at another witness statement. Um, so I'm just looking at the time. Perhaps this is a good moment for our mid-morning break. We will be finished by lunchtime today. Yeah, certainly. That, that, that's fine, Mr. Blake. When do you want to start again? Thank you very much. If we start in 15 minutes time, so 25 minutes to 12, please. Yeah, certainly. Thank you very much. <laughs>